Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 29th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone present, please, to ensure that their mobile phones on silent, are on silent? Sorry. No apologies have been received, so we're going to move straight on to the agenda item one, which is the fifth evidence session on the Island Scotland Bill. We will be having two panels this morning. Uh, the first panel is with us this morning, and I'd like to welcome uh, Camille Dressler, uh, Chair of the Scottish Islands Federation, Rachel Hunter, uh, the Area Manager of Shetland Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, David Richardson, the Development Manager, Highlands and Islands and the Federation of Small Businesses, and Fraser Greve, the Regional Director of Highlands and Islands Scottish Council for Development and Industry. We'll be going through a series of questions. Uh, for those of you that haven't done this before, you don't need to push anything on your uh, panels in front of you. Uh, the sound uh, gentleman will, will pick you up when you want to speak and will automatically activate your microphone. If you do want to come in on a question, just try and look at me and I'll bring you in. Uh, the secret is then not to do as some people do, is to continue, to continue to speak and look in the opposite direction because if you were, are going on a bit long, I might want to reduce... Uh, you and I will catch your eye uh, to, to, to ask you to, to come to an end. So we're going to move on with the first question and the first questions this morning are going to come from Rhoda. Rhoda. Thank you. Good morning. Um, can I ask if the bill meets with your expectations and indeed your aspirations? <coughs> to head off on that. Camille, would you like to come? Uh, very much so. I uh, think we are delighted that the islands uh, um, will be considered in that way and that island proofing to us is as important, is, is as the same as rural proofing. We have some slight concern about rural proofing because we don't think it's, we're not aware that it's done, been done so well and we would like island proofing to be done as best as possible and uh, it's a concept that's absolutely essential for um, the well-being of the islands, in our opinion. Rachel, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, uh, from Highlands Islands Enterprise point of view, we welcome the, the Islands Bill. Um, you know, as, as, as you're aware, the, the clues in the title, we're ambitious for the Highlands and the Islands uh, uh, across the region. And um, we think that this, this bill could help, you know, to, to harness the natural resources on the islands, to influence, influence greater in, innovation and enterprise, uh, and also to uh, in, sustain and enhance communities within these uh, islands. Fraser, you would... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for us... Um, there are some really welcome things, particularly the development of a, an island plan um, and to make sure that that's long term enough um, to enable uh, the, the economic potential of the islands to be realised. I mean, I think um, in, in many ways, island proofing shouldn't be necessary. It should be incumbent on all public bodies and, and all legislation to consider how it impacts on, on every part of the country anyway. Um, but I think it's really important to, to consider where where solutions will be different for, for island communities, which are essentially remote communities attached to other remote communities, um, and the, the, the particular amplification of the, the challenges they face as a result. OK, David, I'm not going to leave you out. Would you like to say anything, or are you happy that everyone's reflected your views? No, I think, I mean, broadly speaking, yes. We, we think the bill is a good idea. Um, to better understand the um, aspirations and the issues faced by island businesses we surveyed, right across all islands, and we got some very interesting results. So, yes, by definition, islands are bodies of <coughs> land in the middle of a sea, so they are different. But also, as I think maybe Fraser slightly alluded to, remote areas of the mainland are also got the same sort of issues. So we tried to find out what the differences were, and we think there is an, a, a case for an island bill. OK, Stuart, do you want to come in before I bring Red back in? Uh, just Fraser made particular reference to island proofing and public bodies. Should what we're trying to do have any implications for private bodies? It's, a, it's a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting one. I think there are certainly issues around um, the delivery of some services. So, for instance, there's been issues around delivery charging. Um, there's issues around broadband provision and the, the service level that, that people get in, in, in islands. I think... Um, I think part of part of that should be looked at as part of the the island plan. What what can be done um, to not help um, 
maintain the islands as, as the rest of the, the economy grows, but actually what can be done to, to transform them, to really utilise their, their assets and strengths and put them ahead where they can be. Um, so it's not, not a, a catch-up game, as, as is often the case with uh, remote and rural areas, but actually going, what, what are your unique assets and, and strengths and how do we amplify those so that, that we're not comparing like for like, that we're actually enabling islands to, to, to progress at a faster pace where, where they have the strength to do so. Okay, Rhoda, would you like to... Sorry, C Camille, sorry, I, I'll let you in uh, and then bring Rhoda in. Uh, just uh, one little point, I think that's quite important. Um, in the Lisbon Treaty, there's an Article 174, which recognises the permanent geographical constraints uh, of islands, mountainous regions and sparsely populated uh, areas. We've made the representation to the uh, Scottish Parliament <coughs> on this issue some years ago, and I would like um, us to be clear that it's, it's a very important principle that islands have got these particular geographical constraints that will never go away because you won't be able to build a bridge to every island. So this is what makes, so, makes it so important to, to have an island bill. Uh, just in, in balance before I bring Rhoda back, we have heard in the evidence session that there are rural communities who feel as remote as islands. Um, at, al although they're same. not islands, they still might need ferries to get from, from, from A to B. So, it, I mean, I, th I, think, I think the problems are faced by many. Rhoda, do you want to come back in on that? Yes, um, I'm interested to know whether you feel that it'll empower islands or will it just change people's attitudes on how they legislate and deal with islands and public bodies? Do you think there'll be more co-production or that people will think that um, the way they treat islands should be different or will islands actually be allowed to start making decisions for themselves? If we go back to the principles that were expressed in the, um, in the Scottish Rural Parliament, for instance, of um, having um, a holistic and proactive approach to development, what uh, the view that we have is that it should be top-led but very much bottom-fed. If if there is a if if this legislation allows the islanders, the communities that live on the island, to inform the policies and comment on them and and have an, a way to to make them more uh, performing better, I think that will lead to a greater well-being in the islands generally. Does, does anyone else want to come in, uh, Rachel? And that yeah. Well, I just. Just thinking, because I am from Shetland, thinking about the example of the the, the ZCC Act uh, um, and uh, around Shetland waters, and you know, no development can take place, uh, you know, within 12 miles uh, without a works license. Uh, and what this does is that, that local powers uh, it gives it gives uh, the Shetland community a basis for negotiation. Uh, and I think that's that's really important, so that the the Shetland community feel empowered that they have influence over what happens in their waters. And I think that if you if you uh, look at the, the the creation of a marine licensing scheme, that seems to be broadly welcomed by other um, island and and coastal communities uh, across the region. Ray, did you want to follow up on that, or will we move on to the next bit? Uh, well, well, really. Do you think there is sufficient in the bill to empower communities <coughs> is really what I'm trying to get at. Do we need to strengthen the bill to create more empowerment or is there enough in there? Difficult question. Who'd like to, to go with that? R Rachel, you almost looked as so though you were about to. <laughs> well, I, I think this. we need to look at... Um, uh, I suppose other legislation that's uh, you know that's come into force, uh, such as the Community Empowerment Act, you know, that's Section Two in December 2016. So, you know, again, that is um, you know revolutionising community planning and uh, ensuring that communities are engaged in, in developing locality plans and local outcome improvement plans. Um, I think it's difficult. I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know how it's going to uh, impact in the, in the future. But I, th I certainly think, you know, through island proofing and island impact assessments, there will be more thought and consideration to, to island issues and challenges. Uh, and also through the development of the National Islands Plan will help focus uh, public uh, bodies on, on, on island needs and, and, uh, uh, and, and challenges. Um, 
Fraser, I don't know if you want to come in. Could, if, if, could I just say to the witnesses, could you give me a pretty good steer and a nod of the head if you want to come in? Because I look at you and, you and some of you are looking away as if you don't want to answer. <laughs> so a, a bit of a steer would be help, Fraser. Would you, would you, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the, the, the challenges and where, where the success or failure of the bill will be, it will be around engagement. It won't work if it's a, a tick box um, at the end of a form, just have you have you considered the island? It has to be really looking at, is this the right solution? Is there a better way of delivering it? Are we the right body to deliver it, or is it better being delivered locally? And I think um, part of that won't come out until the, the development of the, the, the island plan and, and how that looks. But I think uh, from a, a starting point, what this does is it, it, it sets the discussion going, um, and I think that's always, always a helpful... OK, I'm going to bring David in and then move on to some questions from John Finney, if I may. David? Yeah, I think our, our point, uh, we believe that small, small air businesses should be at the centre of the thinking because they're the ones that are going to drive the economy forward and help communities and islands achieve their full potentials. Um, and it's how that takes place. And there should be more consultation and discussion, not tick box, but proper discussion when things are being put through. So... When it comes to government, when it comes to public agencies, when it comes to communities, they should be thinking, what's right for the business community here? Because that ultimately, everything stems from that. Hey, John, I'm Finney, would you like to come in uh, with your questions, please? Uh, yes, thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, <coughs> we've already received a lot of views about what should be in the bill, what uh, uh, um, should be in the plan or could be in the plan. I wonder with regard to differing labour markets and particularly the labour markets uh, between the mainland and the islands and perhaps even within island groupings, do you think the bill has sufficient cognize, taken sufficient cognizance of that? Who'd like to head off on that? Uh, David, I'll let you come in there. What I can say is that our, our survey showed that of um, those business that employ staff, 38% are being held back at the moment because they can't find sufficiently skilled staff. It's a very real issue there. We also know that 41% um, of businesses in the Highlands employ at least one person from the EU. Um, that presumably continues to the islands as well. So staffing is a critical issue. Low unemployment, which, thank goodness, but we've got low unemployment. Um, there's lack of housing, so it's difficult to import staff. Um, so there are, staffing is, 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 is a really important issue. Um, now, does the bill meet the needs? I'm not sure, but they need to be addressed. Um, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I concur with David's point about staff in, in, in island communities. And um, I suppose another issue that, that we find that businesses face uh, in, in, in island communities is, is one of succession as well. I mean, obviously, we want you know, younger people to come in and, and um, be employed by businesses, but who's actually going to lead these businesses in the future? We have an ageing demographic. Uh, and, and island populations are ageing faster than the Scottish average. So you know, a particular challenge in a, a particular area of work that, that High is involved in is to, to support businesses with succession, uh, leadership, management and development in the future. Fraser, you said you'd like to come in, and then Camille, I'll bring you in, if I may. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a, a number of things. I mean, there is a, a, real, a real issue over access to labour, about uh, talent upskilling the workforce, because many small businesses don't need one person to do one job, they need one person to do three or four. Um, and how do we make sure that those skills are available uh, locally? Um, there's a real difficulty around average wages being lower than the, the national average, and, and businesses have to take that on board and do far more um, to to improve their offer. Um, they're simply not going to be able to attract people if they're not able to pay uh, wages that people can afford to live on. Um, and there are there are real issues around access to housing, uh, public transport in, uh, in island <laughs> communities. Um, there is a, a small travel to work area for, for many businesses in these areas and it's almost impossible to get there without a, a private car. Um, so, so what do we do around those those infrastructure points. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the challenge is that these are, are problems not just facing island communities, but across the piece. Um, we, we thankfully have very low unemployment, um, but very high underemployment. Um, and we need to do a lot more to, to, to improve that and address that. Hi did a, a, a business survey recently that showed huge business optimism um, of 78%, um, but yet 
less than 50%, 50% of those, those businesses were, were planning to invest over the next year. If businesses can't invest when they're feeling optimistic, how do we, how do we address that and how do we help them improve their profitability to, to drive up the, the wages that will help sustain and attract more people into the island communities? Camilla, uh, yeah, John, you, you come in, and then Camilla, I'll, I will bring you in. I've got Gail wanting to come in, and I'd like to sort of tackle these. There's a few questions here. So, John. So, a, a recurring theme is about what the purpose of the bill is. W would you see, Fraser, th that as being a purpose of the bill to address these particular issues, or I, is that m more for the plan? I, I, in many ways, it's more for the plan. What the, for, for, for us, what the, the bill does is it, 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 it puts a, an onus um, on the, the consideration of, of the island's needs um, and trying to, to get the, the thinking to actually take place. Um, and it's different thinking. The solutions uh, for island communities are very different. There, in many places, there isn't a, a private sector uh, housing developer that's all of a sudden going to move in and build the housing to, to meet their needs because the housing to meet their needs is two houses there, three houses there. And so how do we... How do we help shape and, and, and develop this? So for, for us, the, the island bill is around putting that onus on, on bodies to, to consider uh, the needs of the islands and, and the development of a plan um, to, to help bring in solutions that are appropriate for each of the, the island communities. Uh, Camille, I'll, I'll bring you in now and then back to uh, John. If you, if you consider the issue of, of competitive tendering, for instance, um, if you need to change uh, an electric bulb in an NHS surgery in Barra, do you think that the, the NHS will uh, call on an electrician in Barra? No. They have to bring their uh, competitive, uh, their tenders, which generally are based in Glasgow or somewhere else. This is ridiculous. This is one of the things that we would like the Island Bill to change. We would like... Uh, we would like also this focus to be on utilities and other commercial bodies to, to make sure that they understand the issues of islands, like of jam, like, uh, you know, all the issues of fuel cost, of, of renewables and broadband, all, all these things have got a massive influence on our economies. And that's where we feel that the island bill could be very, very useful, getting these bodies to understand how the delivery of services have to be island proofed. John. I'll look at all a couple of questions together. I, I'm conscious that, that um, thank you. I, I, I wonder if, if the, the panel's view is that um, the bill will support economic growth. And with, uh, with regard to the consultation, do you think there's been sufficient engagement with small and micro businesses, indeed with the self employed, on this issue? Um, David, that sort of falls in your domain slightly. Yeah. Um, I think it will help, but not in, in the past, it has not been enough consultation. There needs to be far more. Um, the strategic objective, if you like, that came out of our research is that what people want to see next 10, 20 years, the priority is retaining more young people, very close to High's heart, and also attracting young families to move in. Because only by that means, looking at the last, last couple of censuses with the ageing population and the declining in some areas population, the only way to, to ensure succession and everything else is to encourage new blood. Now, that's the primary aim, should be the primary aim of the bill. Um, and to do that, you have to tackle the broadband issues, you have to tackle all the issues that... Um, have just been raised. Camille, would you like to come in on that? I think that's what is essential. Um, there's been so much frustration in the, the, the big companies not understanding the islands. And uh, you could say that the, maybe the government hasn't understood the island either. Look at the issue with broadband. You know, the, the, the tender for delivery of broadband completely ignored the, the, oh, uh, the islands. And in many cases, we've had to uh, create our own uh, broadband um, uh, community it, um, businesses. So I think that it's got to be done across the board, but the devil is in the detail. How is it going to be done? And I've just come back from the European Rural uh, Parliament in, in Holland, and there was a very good example of fin, uh, Finland, which has um, a rural policy board, where which brings together policy makers and, and people from a wide section of the population, including NGOs. And I think that would be really useful to, to look at as a model of how the, the bill is actually going to be implemented. Because one of our frustrations 
as an NGO, as a grassroots-led organization, is that we never get a seat at the table. So how are we going to bring the voices of small communities, the voices of our members, how are we going to bring those to the table? That's a question for you. Okay, I'm going to bring Rachel in, and then I'm going to move on to the next uh, section, if I may. Rachel. Yeah, just about consultation. I mean, hi, uh, other members of the panel have alluded. We do a, a six-monthly high business panel survey, uh, and um, you know that's a thousand businesses across the the region. But it's also important to note that. Uh, the way Highlands and Islands Enterprise operates, we account manage uh, businesses and communities right across the region, and we um, account manage 233 businesses and community enterprises on islands, which is actually 40% 40, 40 of our portfolio. If you think that you know there's only 20% of the population uh, in the Highlands and Islands based on islands, but we we actually, uh, in terms of our portfolio, what we manage, it's 40%. So we disproportionately uh, account manage a, a very high number of businesses and communities on uh, on islands, and we have very close relationship with these businesses and community enterprises. And what they tell us is that in, the, the, the problems and the challenges that are constraining growth are, are, are very much the same wherever you go. It's about uh, you know timely, affordable, reliable uh, transport infrastructure. It's about um, <laughs> You know, super fast broadband, which would enhance in digital and mobile connectivity, and it's what already other panel members have said is is access to young people uh, to help you know uh, attract and retain young people in the islands, and and to and one of the key barriers is is housing. Uh, and uh, Hi has just completed a, a survey looking at the, um, the, the the housing market in in the Highlands and Islands, um, and uh, and it's as interesting to note that. There is a high proportion of young people, what we will call young and stuck, which basically means that they're they're, they're 26 or over. Uh, they are um, that I suppose they are uh, uh, they're they're in full time employment or in or, or they're self employed, but they're not the main householder or the spouse of the main householder. They they're living with family or others, but they. They are the homemakers. They, they, you would expect them to be creating the households of the future, but they don't have the opportunity to do that because of lack of housing in their area. So there is a high proportion of, you know, in the top 12 areas, uh, the, the hot spots for these young and stuck uh, individuals, a high number are in the island's areas. OK, that, that actually, there are other members that want to come in, but I think that's a good place to leave that just at the moment. And I'm going to move on and get John to, to ask a question. Yeah. Okay, thanks, convener. Um, so uh, the islands plan has been mentioned already, so that's the, what I'm wanting to ask about. Um, now, the bill basically only says there's going to be a plan and it gives a bit of time scale and a bit of consultation, but there's no, not much detail. So three parts. Um, firstly, are you comfortable with the concept of an islands plan? Is that a good idea? Secondly, should there be more in the bill about the islands plan? and what the content of the island's plan might be, or are you happy to leave the bill as it is with no detail whatsoever? And finally, um, what about the timetable, the fact that it would have to be laid within 12 months of the legislation? Are you comfortable with that? Thank you, John. For difficult questions. Uh, I, I expect you'll all have an opinion on those three things. So I'm, I'm going to start on, on the, my right and, and work to, to my left. So, Camille, that means you're first. Uh, would you like to go on that? I think that the idea of, of a plan is, is always good, but the plan um, must be fairly general, not too prescriptive, because you don't want it to be a, a straight jacket. So you need to have in that plan something that, to our mind, would look very much like the Smart Island Initiative that we have signposted in our submission, which basically shows how the islands can be leader in the low carbon revolution and, and leader in sustainability if you allow them to be. And um, underpinning these two, two principles, there's a lot of things that do um, derive from that. And But the, the whole point is is to give enough um, flexibility in the plan so that it can be responsive and it can be modified so would you, can I, would you put in the bill would you put that the in in the bill that the plan must <coughs> include sustainability or would you leave the bill as it is oh sustainability must be the underpinning principle of the plan of course but would you say that in the bill well i think it would be absolutely essential Right, I'm, I'm not sure if we're understanding each other. It's essential to be in the plan. 
well, the, the concept of sustainability has to underpin the plan, and therefore, if it does, it needs to be put in the bill. Okay, right, I've got you right. Thank you. And, and sorry, the, the, the timing, I think, was, was the other function. Do you think a year is enough time to draw this up? It's, uh, if the consultation is done in a, in a proper and effective manner, I don't see the problem. Okay. But it, again, it's in a detail. How is the consultation going to be? If you have um, a kind of like rural parliaments situation where the grassroots and community organisations are consulted, I don't think it would be a problem. Okay, I mean, just, just before I move to Rachel, I mean, I think on the evidence sessions that we've heard on the various islands, because just to, to remind people, we've been to Orkney, we've been to Mull, and we've been to the Western Isles, it, it appeared that there was a certain amount of consultation and pre-planning that had gone on, but some of the islands may not be at that advanced stage, and I think that's, John, is that the, the <coughs> one of your concerns? I'm not sure I'm concerned about it, but let's hear all the uh, panel and then we might come back after that. Right, Rachel. Yeah, well, in terms of HIE, then we you know, support the concept of an island's plan. Um, you know, in terms of what we we think the focus should be on, on uh, outcomes uh, and not activities, and that there should be a... Um, a clear vision and ambition in the plan. Uh, looking, you know, islands should have a say in what they want their islands to look like in five to ten years' time. Um, and also, the plan should, um, you know, track key indicators and metrics, so it actually demonstrates that progress is being made. Um, I think, you know, the, the 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 issues around sustainability. I mean, I, I think. You know, all islands. That's what they're striving for: is is uh, economic, sustainable economic growth. Um, so I, certainly, that should underpin the the the, the, the premise of the, the plan. I also think that the um, there has been a lot of work in terms of uh, engagement through uh, the development of community local outcome improvement plans and locality plans uh, in island areas, and we should make sure that the, there's due cognizance of this the the, the work that's already been done. Um, in terms of a year, is a year enough? Um, you know, it's a challenge in geography <laughs> um, that you know a lot of voices want to be heard. Um, you know, it, it, it possibly it depends on which resources is put to it, whether it could be done in a year. But I think it will be challenging. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think the, um, the plan is right. I think something that links policy and strategies a more coordinated approach is good. I think potentially it's going to be useful for. Taking un, un, sort of um, identifying blockages in the current system, national system, and potentially solutions to that. Um, but again, it mustn't be prescriptive. It's interesting. In, I keep referring to our survey, but in our survey, we grouped islands by Shetland, Orkney, you know, Argyll, and so. On. And there are big differences there in the answers, or there are differences between different islands. One size won't necessarily fit all nationally, and it won't necessarily fit all in the islands. There has to be local determination, and. I think it's really important, keep going back to this point, but really important that um, businesses are consulted. As an organisation, we serve it. We can say X percent say this and Y percent say that, but that should be supported by real-life case studies where people are actually going out and talking to businesses and actually getting into the nitty-gritty you know, with them. It's really important. So can I take it from what you're saying that um, you're quite happy with this kind of very just general that there will be a plan? You, you don't feel it should be too prescriptive in the bill? I don't think so, no. I think it, it, a general a plan that really it's about linking policies and strategies between different organisations and it's ensuring that organisations like High, for instance... Well, then, that there'll be that linking of strategies. Should that yes. be, should that be yes. said in the bill? Yes. About and, the plan? Yes, and, the, and the, the, the bill should be written in such a way that, for example, High, who might have a priority is, is set to it, is, is export. And export is the right strategy for the Highlands and Islands as a whole. But it might be on some islands, business survival and <laughs> continuity is much more important than exporting a widget to somewhere else. So we wouldn't so, put exports in the bill? No, no. but it, it must allow, enable these organisations to have that flexibility so that they can have different approaches to different islands and things. Okay. Fraser. Um, and Fraser, sorry, uh, although you're last, I'll give you a chance to be first. If you, the short, a short answer would be appreciated just on that. I concise as, answer. Uh, as, 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 as concise and brief as I can. I mean, I think uh, the development of a plan is uh, uh, very welcome. I think a year is, is absolutely sufficient time. I mean, it's not a, a document that at the end of that period, that's it, put it on the shelf. It has to, to evolve. And what the, the plan for me really is about is saying 
we are putting a duty on people to think about the needs of the islands and spending a year developing a plan and saying this is our plan and as you're considering the islands this is what you have to do to to meet it i think um when rachel touched on, on on metrics and all that and i think there there absolutely has to be uh, measurables in it and um, but i think there is a, a always a, a danger that the islands get lost in spreadsheets um losing a doctor from one I island could be losing its entire health service um and I think it's really important, particularly for these um, isolated and, and, and island communities, uh, to think about the people and how do we how do we develop um, continuity? Um, how do we make sure that there will be replacements for these professionals um, and to, to really plan for the long term as well as having the, the short term actions? You particularly health. So should the bill should the bill say that the plan must deal with health? Or do we just assume that the plan will deal with health? I, I, th I think for me, the, uh, the sustainability of island communities relies on, on health, on housing, on transport, on skills, on all of these things. And I think um, in order to, to develop a planet, it will naturally have to consider all of these, these aspects anyway. So I don't particularly feel a need to, to have it in the bill. So you wouldn't even put sustainability or population in the bill? If we didn't think about the sustainability of the island, I don't think the bill would be necessary. Um, so I, I, I suppose for me, I, I, I'm not ready to being entirely mentioned because the, the whole purpose of the, the bill and of looking at this area is around the sustainability of the island. I, 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 Camille, I, I, you will come back in at a, a later stage because I'd like to bring Gail in because there's a few more questions on this particular thing. So you will get a chance to come in in a minute. Gail, sorry. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, how do you think the National Island Plan could address some of the challenges faced by businesses on the island? And particularly, we talked about um, depopulation and that moved on to housing. If the plan addresses housing, how far into that do you think it should go? Because you've got access to land, you've got price of land, you've got um, the planning system, various factors about you know why affordable or, or even housing full stop is not available. Um, and I was particularly um, taken by the young and stuck um, that you were talking about, Rachel. That's really interesting. We also heard about the cost of building houses, getting materials over to the islands can be at least 40% higher than it is on the mainland. So do you think that there are things such as that that could be addressed or can't be addressed, delivery charges, all these sort of access to materials and things? How do you think they can be addressed in the plan, if indeed they can at all? Who'd like to to go first on that. Camille, would you like to go on that? I, I was going to add, add it's just not uh, economic sustainability, it's social sustainability as well. You know, like in a small island, like the one that I represent, you have uh, 30 people on the Isle of Ram, 35 people on the Isle of Muck, 80, uh, 105 people on Egg, 12, going down to six on Cana, if you don't have social sustainability, these islands will die. So social, economic is, is, is linked with the social, and that means access to, trans, to, to housing, access to medical, to, to everything, is very much dependent on having a transport strategy that will meet the, um, the aim and aspiration of the islands. RET has done a lot, but, um, um, we're working with Caledonia McBrains at the moment about the freight issue. How can we have a freight issue that is fit for purpose? Because it's, it's fundamental. If you have an RET system for cars, for passengers, you have to have an RET system for freight. And how that is going to be delivered, it's not for us to say. It's for, it's for our, all of us to work together with, with yourselves, with the Department of Transport, with the Ferry Division. It's it's a it's a complex issue. <coughs> David, do you want to come in on that? And then I'm going to bring Stuart in and come back to go. Well, I just say I, I'm not an expert in legislation by any stretch of imagination, but um, it seems to me that it's a, a lot, an awful lot to ask one bill to look at broadband and housing and everything else. 
On the other hand, if the bill gets people talking about these issues and focusing on island problems, then that's a very good thing. So it's more about getting the discussion going and focused rather than saying broadband across Scotland, yes, we've got this issue, or you know, housing's a problem in Scotland. It's focusing on islands. And then within that, within the plan, it should be specific islands and their needs. And it, it's about getting minds focused. Mr. Stuart, can I bring you in and then I'll come back to Carol? Uh, I just wanted to pick up on uh, Camille's reference to Caledonia and McBrain. Um, we'll, we'll look at island proofing later in our questioning, so it's a more generic question. The list of bodies that are covered um, includes, for example, at number 13, David McBrain, but it doesn't include Caledonian McBrain. Now, I'm, I'm a bit uncertain as to why that's the case. It's clear that a number of the government's companies, including David McBrain, are included, but not the subsidiaries of those companies. There are councils who are included, but not the companies that are owned by those councils. For example, Orkney has an interest in six companies um, in housing, in towage, in farming, and in ferries. Um, and I just wonder whether it should be a more, whether we need a more generic approach that says all the things that are on here and all bodies that they control. Because Specifically, CalMAC came up, and it's specifically not on the list. Only the owner of CalMAC is on the list, which is David McBrain. Uh, quite a specific question. Would anyone like to uh, tackle that? Um, somebody's going to have to give Stuart an answer. <laughs> well, <don't> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Camille, I'll let you answer it, and then I'm going to come back to Gail. I'm happy to say yes. I think Kelly and McBrain definitely, but also we are aware that Kelly and McBrain doesn't cover the the Shetlands and, uh, and uh, Orkney. So any ferry companies that's, that serve the island has to be, all the bodies, everybody's got to be involved. So that was partly what was in my mind when I asked about private companies earlier. I'm going to come back to Gail um, with, a, with a further question. Yeah, just to ask, um, the, the bill, we talked about social aims, Camille, and you're quite right, but do you think that the economic aims of the bill in particular should be more explicit? Do you feel that there are any economic aims in the bill, or should there be any in the bill? Who would like to? Uh, Rachel. I think, I mean, and David alluded to it earlier, but, um, you know, having a, a sustainable economic base is, is you know, is the lifeblood of, of an <laughs> island. Um, um, what we find in islands is that we've got high levels of employment, for example, but if people can't find a job, they just leave, and that impacts on the sustainability of the, the services and the remaining, you know, populations within islands. Uh, that's certainly the case in Shetland. We just, we, we have very high levels of employment, but when there's nothing going, people just leave, and this puts an impact on other services. So I think that... Um, you know, a strong and sustainable economy, that, an ambition there to... to, to is, uh, or that, that should be a key ambition of the, the island's plan and the bill uh, uh, going forward. David, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, just uh, again, referring to the survey, 88% of businesses said their islands were good places to do business. But it's quite clear that for them, it was the lifestyle, it was the culture, the, the, the community, that's what held them. 20% had considered moving to the mainland for business purposes. In the Western Isles, it was 29%. So they're always at the back of their mind is, is my business sustainable on this island? Can I continue? Um, and there's always a potential to walk. So I think that's very important that the bill addresses the economics of the thing. And um, yeah, I think whether it's enough in it, I don't know. Um, as it's, it's, it's what's between the lines rather than in the lines that matters. OK, uh, we're going to move on to the next section. Before I do, I'd just like to... to ask one question that came up as a result of um, our visits was somebody said that if, if the island's plan started off with a section that there should be no reduction in current population and in fact the aim should be to increase populations on islands everything else in the plan would flow from that um, does anyone have any views from that or do you think that's a reasonable assumption I mean yes not really my turn, but yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole point about um, economies is you need to have sustainable economies based on a, a, a diverse population, um, a, a, a vibrant population, and for that you need a cross-section of, of, of age groups and you need a, a growing population. A, a population that's declining is going back. 
Um, you need to sustain the post office, the grocery shop, and these sort of things. So, so population on islands, or at least a sustainable population, yes. would probably be the driver for everything else in the bill. Fraser, do you want to come in? And then briefly, Rachel, and then I want to move on to the next section, if I may. Yeah, I mean, I think growing population is, is important. I mean, we've seen, seen the growth of some island populations, but yet the demographic of the, the population uh, change quite considerably. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's striking the balance. It's about making sure there is the, the, the right number of, of working age people and there are the opportunities for, for, for young people. I mean, I think it was which touched on with, with Rhett and things in the importance of, of transport links. It's not just about the, the sustainability of the economies, but without the, the transport connectivity, it's, it's very hard for those businesses to grow. Um, they might be able to sustain on the, the populations there, but actually... How do we help them to, to grow? Okay, I want to bring Rachel in and then we're going to move on to the next question. I think it's just to, to, to echo what's been said already, that it's about demographic balance as well, making sure that we have you know, uh, people of all ages, uh, from, right from the very young to the, to the very old uh, in islands. That's, that's what you know, enhances island life. And I think uh, Hai did some research in, in 2015 looking at the attitudes and aspirations of young people across the Highlands and Islands. And when we, when we drill it down to the young people living uh, uh, or, or wanting to return to the islands, we find that the young people really value the quality of life there and uh, they, they, they recognise that um, they may have to compromise a little maybe on some career progressions, but the, 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 the fact that the islands offer a, a good quality of life, a great place to bring up children, um, these more than compensate for that maybe a potential lack in career progression that they might see in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is going to be from Mike Rumbles. Well, can I just first of all say I'm not hiding behind all this equipment and people, <laughs> and it would be nice to see the panel <laughs> properly, but there we go. Um, I want to drill down on um, island proofing. Uh, it's a big part of the theme. And um, in previous witnesses, we've, we've explored the idea of how to avoid uh, a tick box exercise. Um, so it actually means something more meaningful. Um, We've got, a, we've got a, a list of over 60-odd public bodies which a duty will be put on them to island-proof whatever that means. And that's what I'm trying to find out from you. How do you uh, expect, how would you wish island-proofing to actually operate in practice? Okay, I expect you'll all have a thought on this. Uh, so I'm going to start the other way around from my left to... to to my right, Fraser, if you'd like to start off. Uh, I mean, I think for, for me it's about uh, trying to change the question sometimes um, that as public sector um, reductions take place and services are, are being cut, say there's not enough, uh, there's not enough pupils to, to attend a school or, or anything like that, instead of thinking, do we need to close that school, we start going the other way, how do we attract more kids? Um, so how do we how do we change the sustainability of the public se services that are delivered on islands rather than saying do we need to cut these things to to meet the current population? It's about trying to look look at the longer term um, and making sure that it's not just about meeting the the needs of the population that exists there today, but will the move being made by the the public body or or business or whoever adversely or positively impact on on where where we want that island to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time. Could I just ask more specifically? Yeah, I, think, I think it's a slight misunderstanding. What I'm trying to get at is the bill puts a legal responsibility on, the, on these 60-odd public bodies. How do you want it to operate? In other words, should headquarters be in Glasgow or Edinburgh, somebody in that, that office think, oh, well, I've looked at that and I've ticked that box because I've thought about the islands, asked a few questions... How, physically, how, what do you want that organisation to do, whether it be Scottish Water or anybody uh, on that list? What do you physically want them to do? Should, should they actually, to give you an example, should, you, uh, should there be a requirement on those, one, each of those public bodies to consult people in the islands before they make decisions? That's just one example. I'm going to do because that's a specific question. I, I might let you back in if I've got time, Fraser, at the end. And I'll move straight to, to David to answer that because you were nodding furiously. Yeah, well, on absolutely. That. Um, we think island proofing might be more effective, sort of considering um, economic strategy. Um, but when it comes to 
impact assessments, often it is, as you say, tick box. Very seldom do people get out of their offices in Glasgow or Edinburgh or wherever else and actually talk to real people. Now, people come to us often and say, we want to talk to business, but how do we go and talk to a business? Well, you actually knock on the door and you go in the business and you say, can I speak to you? And it's very simple and not enough of it happens. So I think it's getting out there and meeting people on islands and actually talking to them. That counts. You leave that, you might spend a couple of days doing it, a bit of cost, but the benefit you get is massive compared to sitting reading boring reports uh, on a bit of paper. Um, that's what needs to happen. Rachel. Yeah, I suppose we, we think the island impact assessments, there should be a clear sort of uh, uh, um, link to the National Islands Plan, the outcomes. So it, it, it should look at the, the, sort of the, 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 the interventions that um, the Islands Plan is seeking to, to, to undertake and, and, and in, in looking at the... I was looking at, so say, potential impacts such as uh, population or de de demographic balance, then the island impact assessment should clearly assess whether any interventions or policy or strategies will have a negative impact on that. Um, we also, I suppose, in terms of the, the impact assessment, it, it shouldn't be just a tick box exercise. What it should also do is um, it should, it should, public bodies should be starting to think creatively how they mitig mitigate against negative impacts. So, you know, for example, um, uh, Fraser spoke earlier on about the if a one doctor, you know, moves out of a small island, then you know the, the whole you know public health system can can crumble. Um, you know, the the uh, you know the public body in that particular case would maybe look at uh, creative ways in which health services could continue to be delivered on that island. So it's, it's not just about a tick box exercise, it's about actually um, you know, asking public bodies to think creatively. Um, I, you know, we're all, we've all got resource pressures, but how, how can we deliver services more innovatively and creatively in, in, in island areas? Okay, so it, it appears you're saying positive discrimination uh, to, to make islands work more. Camille, would you like to... I think that's one of the things that we were trying to visualize because that's, that's a difficult one. And first of all, making sure that whatever consultation is not tokenistic. Good example happened in the um, Highland um, Council Education Department. They just uh, tried to impose a, a complete change in our education system in the small isles. And they said, but we have consulted you, yes, two days uh, before the, the changes were due to be to be made. So proper consultation, meaningful consultation, um, having a, a list of stakeholders and making use of these stakeholders, um, knocking on the door, phoning them, emailing them, making survey. There's a lot of uh, tools that are out there that can be done. Perhaps also making sure that some of the bodies that are got to, to, to Island Proof are actually doing something about what they have done. I'm thinking about the National Trust of Scotland. How many uh, surveys and plans have they made to make sure that Canada will not remain depopulated? They make another plan, they put it on the shelf, and nothing happens. The island continues to be depopulated. So give, give also, um, give teeth to that uh, Island Proofing so that Action is followed by the consultation. Fraser, uh, I, I didn't let you come back having had a... But if you want to come in now, now's your opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's just about public bodies and, and others giving some, some thought as to the, the potential negative impact and whether uh, their services can be delivered by other public bodies or if they've, they've had discussions. So it's about showing evidence um, that they have, have properly considered... Uh, the positive and negative impacts of, of what they're doing and looked at uh, mitigating factors to that. Okay. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Jamie Green at this stage. Uh, thank you, Vina. Good morning, panel. Um, we've heard some fascinating um, comments uh, this morning, um, and I, I think it really is interesting. We're starting to round up these evidence sessions and, and start to bring it together. I think, given the expertise around the table, I'd like to focus on the economic potential of the bill, um, specifically around business. So given that the majority of the authorities listed in the schedule of the bill are so-called public authorities or public services, public bodies, government departments, etc., cetera, um, very little is mentioned of the private sector, for example, utilities companies, um, 
telecommunications businesses and so on, of which have a, a substantial part to play, and it falls on from what Stuart said. Um, does island proofing, as it's currently written in the bill, actually address any of the economic issues that affect islands? Uh, I'll open that out to the panel. Um, David, it looks like a logical place for you to start, and then I'll bring in Rachel because I didn't let her in on the last one. Sorry. Uh, maybe a case study uh, on the utility front. Uh, last June 2016, Business and Barra phoned up and said, we've been without EE signal for three months because basically the kit's out of date. It's broken down. They can't repair it. Well, they're not repairing it. And as a result, um, I mean, it's not a... It's not a, a, a necessity. It's not a. Um, a, a, a it's, it's, a it's an utility. It's an essential thing to have phone signal now. Calmac might not be failing. The ceiling. They couldn't let everybody know. There might be a, an emergency. Doctors couldn't know. Didn't know what was going on. So, um, what had to happen was we had to write to the chairman of EE, and we had to get the press involved. And as a result, the matter was solved fairly quickly because the Times was involved, and the BBC was involved, and the chairman of EE was involved. Should it require FSB to get involved and to make that happen, or should there be some other mechanism by which, when things go wrong, or when your broadband fails, or when something crucial happens, we had another situation in, in Isla this year, where they installed a green cabinet for somebody right beside his house. His business was 200 yards away. It wasn't on the, uh, wired in for no good reason. They switched his ADSL line off, so he had no broadband at all. All his bookings, a boat company, all his bookings went to pot. And um, he couldn't trace his bookings. He was also a member of the local light boat service. He couldn't get signal for that. Again, he had no means of ensuring that he was wired in quickly. We intervened and we got it done very quickly for him. Why are we having to intervene? So I'm not sure how the bill can help with that, but, but that needs to be addressed. How can island communities or individuals put things right? Who do they contact in these situations? Companies that provide these services are not listed in the schedule of the bill, so there's no duty on them whatsoever to island-proof any decisions that they make. You raise the As question. I, I'm simply giving case studies. I don't know is the answer to that. Okay, Rachel, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of highest response, we, we, we did say that the because of the significant role that some of these utility companies, but also, you know, delivery companies, logistics companies, transport companies, because of the, they have such an impact on island life and on uh, infrastructure development, we, we would suggest that there, there is a consideration made that uh, to extend the duty for, you know, for island impact assessments to these large co corporate organisations because of the, the impact that they have uh, on, on island communities. I was just going to say, in terms of one of my point about island impact assessments uh, earlier that I was wanting to make is that what we don't want to see uh, is island impact assessments holding up development or, uh, or, 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 or policy in island areas. So we don't want to see uh, an island impact assessment being done six months after <laughs> and somewhere uh, in a very remote location. So um, I think island impact assessments, if they are done, they have to be swift and they have to be flexible uh, and um, uh, they have to be incorporated you know, up front in any business case uh, or decision-making process. Okay, uh, just before uh, John, I, I would like to bring you in, but Camille, in your evidence or in the evidence by, from your organisation had suggested that there was an island's office. Uh, were you suggesting, uh, and I'd be interested to hear your views, I'm sure the committee would, on whether the island office could address the very problems that, that David has, has mentioned on the part of uh, small businesses. Camille, would you like to comment on that? Well, if you had such, a, if you had an island desk that would be uh, staffed by people that understood the issues of islands very well and would be consulting with the, a whole range of stakeholders, that might be a shortcut. But uh, certainly, I think that maybe there is one of the problems in the bill, as, as um, uh, we just said, that, that the, um, the utility providers are not listed as... Uh, as needing to buy land proof, because I think that is that is quite quite important for them to be to be included in the island proofing. I think in our in our submission we did say that transport utility providers should be of GEM should all be um, also subjected to island proofing because they have such an impact on our lives. Okay. John Finney, would you like to comment on that? Excuse me there. It was on that specific point there. Um, I absolutely um, I understand the, the implications of um, the utility companies and the telecommunications companies. I'm wondering, assuming that it were competent, and I think there is an issue whether it would be deemed as competent, given that these are reserved issues to be included, 
um, in the, whether it would be competent for Scots legislation to, to say other than an expression of uh, hope. But I, I wonder if, first and foremost, that builds an unreasonable expectation, because, of course, there's frustrations with these companies in urban areas as well. Um, but also whether you feel that there might be the potential, however difficult it might be to shape the move of a, a, a multinational corporation to, to if, at least if public bodies in Scotland are getting it, it gives a, a direction of travel that we should that they should consider it. Uh, who would like to, David? Would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, I mean, there is a the problem with islands is because we've got small isolated communities, they're going to be bottom of the list when it comes to things going wrong, or when it comes to decisions to made close to close banks or other things. You know, remote communities get rid of them first there's a huge knock-on impact on those, the viability of those communities. What you chaps can do about it with legislation, I don't know. I don't know enough about what you can and cannot do. But if we're looking at the sustainability of these islands, if we're looking at trying to encourage more young people to stay on and so on, you've got to have good communications. You've got to, whether it be to the mainland or you've got or to the thing, you've got to have these things. So if the bill can help with that, then great. You, you, you were going to come up with a solution. I was going to, uh, <laughs> maybe not as down as Steve is on that. I think, um, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't think islands are at the, the bottom, but I think there's a, a, a lack of recognition at times over the, the importance of things. If a, a mobile operator's mast goes down, that could well be the only mobile operator that has a mast on that. If a, a road is, is shut for, for maintenance, the, there might not be a detour or the detour might take you the full tour. Um, of the, the island and as well as that might be very pretty it might not be very helpful um, if a bus doesn't appear on time it could be one the only bus that day it's about recognition of the the impact that the failure to deliver a service might have um, in a, an island community which might not be there um, if you are in a, a, a mainland or, or more urban area and I think it's also about the recognition that many of the challenges faced in island communities um, are not only faced in, in other rural communities, but they're very reliant. So Orkney is very reliant on uh, the A9 to Thurso in terms of, of uh, ferry connections, on Aberdeen Harbour, on the delivery of services on other parts of, 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 of Scotland. And I think it's about making sure that, that those connections are considered not just for, for their area, but there are no con consequences for islands too. I'm, I'm going to bring Jamie back in, and then, I'm, Rachel, you're going to be the first to answer his, his, his subsequent question. Thank you, Vino. Um, it's, it's maybe a technical point, but it's probably worth noting that the very first body listed uh, in terms of the duties in relation to the bill is the Scottish administration, and number one is Scottish ministers. And one would assume that by Scottish ministers that also meant their relevant executive agencies, directorates, and so on. However, that's po possibly a question we can ask the bill team when they come in. Um, so that may cover all the relevant um, public bodies which, which cover roads, etc. Um, David, you mentioned something earlier in the session around that you, whilst there are similarities between uh, the problems that businesses face in rural communities and on islands, and we've heard a lot about those similarities, but you, you said you had done some work on specific differences as well and that's something we haven't teased out of you so is, is there any anything you could share on that to enlighten us we asked businesses do you feel doing business on your island makes you different to the remote parts of the mainland 88 percent said yes they do feel that their problems are different but then they put the comments down as to what the differences were and with the obvious exception of ferries and and it was obvious but then again you've got two mainland ferries that can, areas that can only be reached by ferry Noida and scurry um with the exception of ferries, everything really also impacts on mainland businesses. It's a matter of degree. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it might even be slightly less. Because the, different, the problems faced by islands, you know, Sky faces very different problems to Shetland or to the Western Isles. Um, they're not the same. Sky's problems actually are more similar to Lochalsh or Northwest Sutherland, one would argue. Um, so it's a matter of degree when it comes to the business problems they're facing. But I think the one thing that did come out clearly was islanders feel different because they're on islands. And that's the key thing. So one of the, one of the things that uh, one of the problems I have with the island assessment section of the bill is that it doesn't link back to anything. It doesn't link back to the, either the plan or some sort of overarching strategy of the bill. It just it talks about creating an assessment uh, and reporting on that assessment. Um, 
you mentioned a few times about the linkage of strategy and policy and so on. Is there, do you think the bill could be beefed up to ensure that the island impact assessments actually relate to specific objectives? And that's perhaps something Rachel could offer in her response. UM, we, we are quite short on time, so I, I would appreciate a, a, a concise answer because I would like to get on to two other issues very briefly, if I may. So, Rachel. Yeah, I, 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 well, I think the island impact assessments won't make sense unless there is a clear link to the aspirations and outcomes in the National, uh, uh, National Islands Plan, which is based on you know, community aspirations. Yeah. I think we maybe leave it there, and I'll ask uh, Stuart to lead the, the next question. And Stuart, if you could roll them up. Uh, I, I will do that, and, and essentially, I think they're, they're all really directed at Rachel. That doesn't debar others from uh, coming in if they wish. And it, it just really relates to uh, uh, the costs. And uh, my, my questions are, do you think the administrative costs in the financial memorandum make sense? Uh, are they, they, they proper? Um, and do you think the costs will be different in different public bodies? Some of the questions are almost rhetorical, I suspect, but... Uh, uh, and uh, are, th are there other costs that simply the bill isn't addressing that you think might arise? Um, I mean, I, it's difficult to answer for other public bodies, but uh, I suppose you know, from from High's point of view, because we are very much embedded in island communities, um, you know, you know, part of our operating costs are to you know involve in uh, involved in engaging with local businesses and so on. So. Um, I guess we didn't have any particular view on the, 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 the numbers in the financial memorandum, but um, I, I suppose, the, you know, from what I can see, they're realistic. Well, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good <laughs> enough answer. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, does anyone else have any views on the financial memorandum? Uh, I'm going to let uh, Fulton just ask a, a, a question at the end, and I would really ask if you could be very concise in your answers to it, and I'll give you each chance to answer it. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, convener. It was just um, I wanted to ask a, a brief question uh, on the elephant in the room, if you like, uh, in terms of what impact you might think that the Brexit process will have on the, the Islands Bill. And I was particularly interested in David's earlier response when he talked about EU nationals being uh, so important to the Islands. I'm wondering, obviously the convener said to make it very brief, but I'm wondering what sort of thought you've given to that in this process. And so uh, I am going to start with Fraser and give you each a very brief chance to answer that, Fraser. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Brexit certainly has a, has a, a major impact on, on island communities in, in particular, obviously. Everywhere, access to labour, fisheries, um, designated protections, all of these issues um, have a particular impact on on the islands, and it's really important that they are, they are considered as part of the, the process. David. Yep. Tourism is a vital industry to most islands. Um, tourism is heavily dependent on staff. It's very much a, a, public, a, a, a staff service. Um, at the moment, a lot of island people um, don't necessarily want to work in the industry because of the conditions. We've got to raise the profile of tourism um, as, a, as a career, because who knows what's going to happen with the workforce, but the workforce is a key issue. Thank you. Um, answer as well, but how do you think it might impact on the implementation of this bill specifically? Um, uh, David, do you want to uh, briefly answer that, or I'm happy to move on to Rachel while you think about it. I think I'll move on to Rachel to, if you and see whether you want to answer that, Rachel. Well, I'm not sure about the what impact the island bill will have, uh, Brexit will have on the islands bill, but what we do know from the, the businesses that we've surveyed uh, through the Highlands and Islands is that uh, the, the the lack of a, a sort of stable economic climate at the moment is is hindering uh, investment going forward uh, because there is so much uncertainty. Uh, but you know, at subsector level, there are differences in opinion because of the fisheries, for example. Um, you know, the, the the fisheries communities have broadly welcomed uh, um, um, the the Brexit uh, vote. So um, there are differences within different uh, business communities. Yeah, thank you. And Camille, you, you are going to get the last word on this. Oh, uh, no, as, uh, as you can guess from my accent, I'm one of the uh, foreign nationals that will be very affected by uh, by this. Um, Situation, and I would say that a lot of uh, people like myself have moved to islands in the last ten years and feel that their life might be completely destroyed by this uh, Brexit. And that's why I also wanted to bring in the, the 
the principle of uh, contained into the 174 article, it would be a, a very important principle to repatriate to to the to Scotland and to the UK. And my concern is that the the, the UK government doesn't have a, a territorial cohesion policy like the EU has. <coughs> and, and our discussion with um, the island commission of the CPMR has shown that um, we have an island policy at the level of, the, uh, of Europe and what is going to happen to it once Brexit is happening. We've been, ha we, we feel that islands are naturally um, interested in making contact with other islands, not only in this country, but with our counterparts in Europe. And we've already sort of started to work on the clean energy EU islands and what is going to happen to that policy when you have massive amount of money being set aside for this. So I'll leave it to you to consider. A, a series of questions there, and that's probably the, the, the opportune moment to, to bring the meeting to a close and, and thank Fraser, David, Rachel, Camille for, for coming and giving evidence. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it, it's been a very useful session. I'd like to now briefly suspend the meeting to allow the, the panels to change. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to agenda item two. Uh, uh, sorry, agenda item one. We're continuing it. Thank you very much for pointing that out to me. Uh, which is to, to move on to the second panel that uh, we're going to speak to this morning. So I'd like to uh, welcome those members of the panel, Shona McLennan, the Chief Executive, and David Berger of Board Nagalic, Ranald Robertson, Partnership Director of High Trans, Ian McMillan, Principal of Lewes Castle College, University of Highlands and Islands, and Stephen Whiston, have I got that right? Uh, Head of Strategic Planning and Performance, Argyle and Butte Integrated Joint Board. If I could just remind you, those of you that weren't here for the first panel, you don't need to touch any of the technology in front of you. When it comes to your turn, it will, your microphone will be made live. If I could ask you to catch my eye at the appropriate moment and nod, I will try and bring you in. I will do my utmost to bring you in. Uh, and what I would also say to you is if you could keep an eye on me slightly so I don't have to cut you off in mid-flow, I'll try and give you a wee warning that I want to move on to the next person just on a time management issue. So welcome all of you. Uh, the first questions are going to come this morning from Rhoda. Rhoda. Um, can I ask if the bill meets with your aspirations and expectations? So who would like to, Shona, would you like to start on that? Um, thank, Harry here. Thanks, uh, convener. We very much welcome this emphasis on an islands bill and the recognition of the special assets that there are in Scottish islands. Um, I think the, the area where we would suggest strengthening the bill is actually putting at the very start of it what the bill aims to do, uh, of which we view as being to secure sustainable communities in islands. And, and that comes from our the act that uh, set up Borden Gaelic, the Gaelic Language Act, which says at the very outset, the purpose of the act is to secure, with a view to secure the status of Gaelic language. And I think it's something that we refer to a lot in our work, and I think it would really help anyone involved in developing the plan or looking to make sure that the, um, uh, the impact assessments are carried out so as to effect that. So I think having that there could strengthen the bill considerably. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? <coughs> uh, sorry, Stephen. I, I think I'd, I'd also echo that from the health, health and social care's viewpoint. We're really clear about it is about sustaining our most remote and fragile communities. And, and certainly we welcome the sort of requirement within the bill to look at island proofing, building on what we've done to date. Yeah. Rhoda, do you want to come back on that? Yes. Um, do you think it will empower island communities or change the way that government organisations and the like treat islands? I mean, there seems to me to be two aspects. One, people will have regard to how they deal with islands, so that comes top down. Or will, do you think it can empower islands to start influencing how those decisions are taken? Uh, Ronald. Just, uh, I, I caught the end of the last session, so um, just uh, one of the, the points that I picked up quite early on in looking at the bill when I first glanced through it was the, the first agency listed being Scottish Ministers, and it immediately prompted me to check that that did extend to Transport Scotland as an agency who delivers such critical services for our island communities. And I think, um, and I got clarification that, that it does, that the provision for the minister to be included uh, extends to, to agencies. And I think um, looking at that provision and what that means coupled with other, other areas, particularly community empowerment, I think means that this, this bill can only empower our island communities. It'll take them much closer to um, being able to influence the, the specification of services that are essential to them um, and give them a, a much clearer, I think, um, pathway to, to, to influence these processes and these decisions that may may not be clear at the moment. And I think the impact assessment, accepting that it probably needs some time and attention to get it right, means that there's going to be an awareness around decisions that are taken in the centre, how, not just how they, how they impact on an island, the island where the decision's been taken, but how that, um, that spending decision might impact on other islands, because naturally um, the Scottish Government is funding 32 ferry services. Um, and a spending decision that develops one of those services may well have an impact on others as well. So it means there's more of, a, I think, a holistic view going to be taken in the future as we, as we develop our, 
our planning and policy frameworks. It's an interesting answer to that because one of the questions uh, that we heard on the Western Isles was whether Transport Scotland should be a separate uh, consultee at the back on the list. So it's an interesting. Rhoda, and then to Jamie, if I may. Do, do you want to yes, just to own that, because obviously when you're working with, when we're working with islands, we assume, for instance, you island proof for the Western Isles or you mm. island proof for Orkney or Shetland. Um, I, th I think what's coming clear, because we've got islands who have mainland and island authorities, not just island authorities, that becomes clear that individual islands have issues. And it's how you, I suppose, change, have a bill that meets the aspiration of island groups but also meets the aspirations of individual islands, which can sometimes be at odds with the island group. And do you think the bill allows for that, or does that detail have to go elsewhere? David, you'd like to come in on that. <coughs> yeah, just going back to the, the previous question about the empowerment of communities. Um, born in the Gaelic, obviously we work closely with, with the Gaelic community and, and across the whole of Scotland. And um, the islands have a particular... Um, importance to the to, to, to Gaelic language um, of the in the Western Isles for example uh, you know the majority of people in the Western Isles speak Gaelic and various islands within 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 the Western Isles group uh, have different uh, percentages of Gaelic speakers and then across the whole of the western seaboard Gaelic is really important um, and uh, so for, for us the crit critical part of this is empowering these communities empowering the Gaelic community to 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 grow and going back to to Shona's point about the, the overall purpose of the of the bill, I think it'd be really important to make that clear that the viability, the sustainability, the economic activity of, of islands is critical. And it's critical to, to our work in terms of growing the Gaelic language that we have economically viable communities within these islands to continue to, to, to speak Gaelic. Just just to, to try and widen that out a bit, can I take two supplementaries from Jamie and, and Gail at the same time to see if we can bring in some of the other witnesses? Jamie, sorry. I appreciate you letting me come in. It's a very important point. I think uh, Ronald uh, raised it on the point that Scottish ministers are first and foremost uh, responsible for island proofing, etc. Um, but as a result of that, therefore, all subsequent government agencies and directorates that fall under that minister are also uh, liable, to use that word. Um, does that, in your view and in your analysis of this, go down to the lowest common denominator in the way that these agencies operate? So, for example, CalMac is listed indirectly under David McBrain, but for example, another private ferry operator company is not listed, is therefore has no direct need to island proof, for example. Um, but would they be covered under the fact that they're working under subsidies given by public agencies or indeed contracts that are awarded by public agencies such as Transport Scotland? I'm quite intrigued to explore how deep that actually goes. Ronald, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to let you in, but I mean, if you could be concise on that, because I'd like to then bring in Gail with... Uh, well, OK, Gail, if, you, if it links, come in at the same time and then give you a chance to answer the two together, Gail. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in the um, island impact assessment and to follow on from what Jamie had said, there are, um, there are decisions that are made on the mainland that affect island communities, um, in particular um, a, a certain bus company who shall remain nameless, changed their timetable and therefore didn't meet the ferry anymore coming over from um, Orkney. So um, do you think that that's something that should be included as well to make sure because island impact assessments are not only things that happen on the islands? I'm sure that hasn't narrowed down the bus company. Uh, Ranald, would you like to answer on that? I know who it is. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, in, in terms of the, 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 the contractual aspect of a, you know, a government funded service, my understanding, but I could be wrong, is that that doesn't um, apply the, the duty on, on the contracting body, but in our evidence we suggested that, um, similar to the, the National Living Wage Pledge, that maybe there would be some value in, in government um, procurement encouraging um, the, the requirement to complete island impact assessments where there's government finance, and that's not just where it's a, a direct contract, because there is significant um, public funding going into air services as well, which still sit entirely commercial on paper. So th there could be value in that. How that might apply again with um, looking at bus companies, and I'm very conscious of the, the legislation that trans that's going to be considered in terms of the transport bill by Parliament as well. I think perhaps it, it becomes very difficult to include mainland bus services as part of an island's bill. 
in, in a similar fashion. I think I recognise that Scottish or Neudart are very difficult to include um, within this as well. But perhaps we, we need to, to ensure that other aspects of legislation link, link appropriately um, one to another. And I think there is an opportunity with the Transport Bill coming before Parliament to perhaps um, consider, this, consider the importance and maybe a hierarchy around what, what different transport services are doing in terms of their functions, where they're, they're very strategic and providing very important lifeline links onto other services and encouraging better links. We, we, we've had very, very frustrating experience with um, uh, new, new ferry services going on that don't connect with trains and things, things like that. I'll stop there, I'm conscious of time. Bring in briefly, Shanna, and then move to the next question. If I know. It was just in reference to <coughs> other legislation because we also responded to the consultation on the socio-economic duty and highlighted the challenges that remote areas have and that that should be considered as part of a when, when um, contracts or policies are being made, that the, the, the challenges that remote areas um, endure should be considered as part of a socio-economic duty, not purely on, a, on a, a financial poverty basis. So that links to transport and, uh, and I think to this bill as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next section, if I may, John. Um. Thanks, uh, convener, and that's uh, to do with the National Islands Plan. Um, I mean, as things stand, uh, the bill <laughs> says that there will be a plan, says there has to be some consultation, but doesn't go into any detail. Now, I note that we've already had the statement made that um, there should be something right at the beginning of the bill about sustainable communities, and that would therefore feed on. But do you think, I mean, first of all, do you, do you agree that a National Islands Plan is a good idea? But secondly, perhaps more importantly, should there be a bit more detail in the bill about what should be in the plan? N not so, so, I mean, I think my last panel will get a bit confused, but um, not so... Therefore, we're not discussing at the moment what is in the plan, but what should be in the bill about the plan. Uh, and then also the time scale as to is 12 months realistic for uh, bringing the plan into place. I'm going to bring Ian in on that. I, th I think the answer, the initial answer to the question is yes, the, no the development of a national islands plan is a good thing. Um, I think in legislation it would be difficult to be too prescriptive. I don't think it would be too helpful to be prescriptive in the legislation as to what that plan should be, although I think, as was mentioned in the last session, there is a need, I think, to keep it focused on outcomes, with a view to looking at, at, at key outcomes that uh, the government actually wishes to see and for that, these outcomes. Is that, is that like sustainable development is the kind of outcome? It, it, it is at, 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 a, at a fairly high level, because there, there is a danger, there is a danger that if it becomes too prescriptive, that it does, by the very nature of that prescription, it becomes a tick box exercise. I think there is a need for the plan to outline where we want to be in five years' time or in ten years' time, what that direction of travel is. And it's important then that it enables conversations to take place between the, the bodies involved and the communities so that uh, there can actually be open dialogue between these agencies in terms of policy changes, in terms of what they service changes. Because I think it's that dialogue that will determine how successful this, this will be in future. And I think the, the bill itself and the plan should facilitate that dialogue. Okay. Okay, I'm going to bring Shenner in, and then I'd like to bring Stephen in, because the whole if issue of planning and how detailed it is, I think, is fundamental. Shona. Um, under the Gaelic Language Act, we have a responsibility to develop uh, a national Gaelic language plan every five years. So our experience relates, I think, quite closely to the idea of an islands plan every five years. Um, and that is something that we, we go through consultation with all the stakeholders and we present to ministers for consideration. Um, and I think what the plan does is it gives a great focus to what we want to achieve for a specific thing. In our case, Gaelic language and culture. In this case, it would be for the islands. What, what are the, the overarching aims? 
our, our plan is not a detailed document, it sets st strategy direction and we are currently on the third iteration, the third draft of that. Our two previous plans have, have definitely demonstrated improvements because we focused on what we wanted to see happening and research has shown that those plans have brought improvements. Um, we've kept it at high level. This in this iteration, we're proposing that we also have a, a delivery, an implementation plan that sits along the high-level strategic plan. So that may be something um, that the islands plan could develop. That's not written down in legislation. That's that's just a different approach that we're we're taking. So, that's good. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, not no, familiar with the act, no. but does the act talk? in more detail about the plan or is it like this it's, that the act it's like this it's like this right? it's saying it will be prepared this is the period in which it will be prepared this is the process for approval and and this is how you go on to do your next one so it's very it's very similar in that way and what we would say having just been through the process of developing the third plan that 12 months would be very tight because we actually started uh, the consultation process, the development process for the third plan in March 16, and we submitted it to ministers uh, in June 17. And that was having had two plans already. What, what I would say, because we are also members of the Convention of the Highlands and, and, I, and Islands, and a lot of the kind of discussions about um, the economy, housing, transport, health, education are happening there. So there is perhaps a, 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 you know, a body of work going on already that may feed into the island's plan that may enable it to be done within 12 months. But it, I think that's tight. Um, John, before I bring Stephen in, do you want to pick up, so maybe we can get an answer from Stephen, the issue of time that, that, that Shona's mentioned? Or? The 12 months? Yeah. Happy to hear from him, yes. Um, certainly, I. I in our experience, we view that as ambitious because of, I think your points there made there, Shona, about the number of agencies involved in bringing those things together and our communities understanding how that all fits together. And, uh, and um, I just know within health and social care, we have a three-year strategic plan. Our vision's mapped out for that. Our consultation process was compressed and we're still going through iterations of people understanding what that means, even with us establishing local planning forums for health and social care and bringing that up to the right maturity level. Um, and that's a real, that's when you come into that sort of difficult balance of communities, expectations, aspirations, as opposed to health and social care need and how we need to transform and support communities in delivering that. And so when you match that to the other agencies' plans, it actually becomes complex to say the least, but are we aligning it in the correct way? Because absolutely transport infrastructure, cultural development, all in, in, impinges on all those areas. So I do think 12 months is ambitious. Um, can it be done? Anything can be done, level of resource, focus, etc. But at the moment, I would, I would suggest you might want to revisit that unless you're going to put more resources into that. Do you think that health, which is your side, I think, mm -hmm. isn't it? Should that be mentioned in the Act, or are you relaxed as well that we just assume that's in the plan? Well, I think because it's covering all public bodies, health is, is picked up within that. I don't think there should be a specific one. There is, I mean, from the information that we've presented, you'll know the way that we provide health across 23 inhabited islands. We have resident pres presence on a few of those, not all of those. People have very different expectations as a consequence of the legacy around that. If you start, I think, focusing in on, on a particular public body or agency, you will raise expectations beyond what needs to be delivered. And I use the word need again. Uh, I'm going to bring Gail in now, if I may. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, how do you expect public bodies to feed into the development of the plan? Um, to what extent do you expect to consult with your own stakeholders? And do you think that there are any resource implications to the consultation exercise? Oh, gosh, that's a, a, a difficult question. And Shona, you, I think you're, you're directly in the fire line because you've had experience of this before. Um, what, what our, um, and I'll, I'll approach this perhaps from two angles, both how we 
work with developing a national plan, but also what we've done to some extent, I think, in, in doing impact assessment for island communities in the third national Gaelic language plan. So we, we've, I've got two approaches there. In terms of consultation um, and, and building a plan, um, we, we kind of, it's fairly easy to recognise the Gaelic stakeholders. So um, so we, we did some work with them, bringing them together. But then because the, the viability, the sustainability of the language is dependent on people having jobs, people having housing, people having education, you know, all the things we've talked about this morning, we, have, we also work with the public bodies who, whose role it is to de deliver and support those services and functions. So we consult with them in saying, here are our ambitions, how can you help us to deliver, deliver on those ambitions and, and deliver your own ambitions as well, so that there's a collaboration between the two. And in terms of who will actually draw up an island's plan, I think... To me, it's not clear. With Gaelic, the Act set up, Bordna Gaelic, and one of its main functions is to develop a national Gaelic language plan. When it says ministers will develop um, a national islands plan, my question was, who, how? And, and, I, and I'm not sure that you would want that level of detail in the bill itself, but I think it's something that I would recommend uh, exploring as to actually how that is going to be taken forward and who is it that's going to collaborate with all these bodies that are listed so that they know that they have a role in developing impact assessments, in that there is this desire among Scottish ministers, this ambition that there are sustainable island communities. And what does that mean for them in terms of how they deliver a service? Their strategy, is it from the outside to the in, inside? What does the financial modelling mean then for things like housing? So I think, you know, and trying to do that within 12 months, I think, is, is hugely ambitious. So that's the kind of, in developing a national plan, that would be my perspective on that. What we've done for our kind of um, island impact assessment in the Gaelic plan is we've looked, as, as Divey said, about the high levels of Gaelic speakers in the communities, particularly in the Western Isles and in other of the West Coast Islands, and said, what do we need to do differently to support those communities as opposed to the growing communities around Gaelic medium education in cities and towns. So we've actually said there are different approaches needed and that's, so we have to do that. Yeah. Ian Inch, but just make it clear, we're, this, this term island proofing, uh, which seems to be being used, is, is going to come up as a sec separate section uh, shortly. So, Ian, if I could bring you in. Uh, thanks, thanks, convener. I, I think there's a clear role for community planning partnerships and, uh, as Shona mentioned earlier on, the Convention of the Highlands and Islands. I think it's going to be critically important that we're clear how these different groupings work together in terms of developing uh, developing the plan, because there is a, there's already a lot of activity that's being undertaken within community planning partnerships. I understand that it's easier for those of us that are located completely in islands because our focus is completely within islands and that that's maybe a bit more challenging for the Argyll and Butte area and uh, the Highland Council area. But we've already been very focused in, in the islands in developing our local outcome improvement plans uh, and looking towards the same, the same challenges in effect that have been mentioned in relation to this bill and uh, the National Islands Plan. So there is a, already a body of work that's been undertaken, and I think it would make sense to to make use of that that work. I think there is always a danger that we end up tripping over one another because there are so many people 
involved or the same people involved in developing similar solutions, but doing so in, in different guises. And, and there is always a... It's one of the challenges that we have in islands anyway, is that we tend to come to a, a lot of groups wearing different hats with different responsibilities. And it's sometimes hard to to keep the focus on why you're there and who you're actually representing. But I, I, I think it's been mentioned earlier about the plan. I think it, who is actually going to own the plan and coordinate the plan, I think, is the critical thing. Because there are these bodies already in existence who should be able to uh, work together to involve all stakeholders and to pull together the plan. We talked about the time scale as well being ambitious. Well, I'm afraid it has to be ambitious. Uh, and if we take too long over this, then we won't get anywhere particularly quickly. Okay. With the community planning partnerships already being in place and the local improvement plans either completed or being worked on, do you see any financial implications for the consultation phase? Um, <coughs> I, I, I would expect there will always be financial implications because we will have to change what we, what we do although that should be part and parcel of what we're about uh, in any case. Uh, or, or I would hope that that's what, one of the main reasons that we're there is to serve our communities. Um, and while there is likely to be some additional cost as we move our feet to respond to, to a, a different requirement, I think there is, a, there is an, an increasing alignment of these policies. And I think with the National Islands Plan, that that for the islands areas can pull all of these together and give us a clear focus and give us a clearer steer that while there may be additional requirements initially, that that should improve over time. Okay, I think that neatly leads us on to the next section. Uh, um, Mike. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I want to drill down specifically on the whole issue of island proofing. Um, You'll be aware that in the bill, in the annex to the bill, there are over 60 public authorities that there is now an would be a legal requirement for them to island-proof any policy that they, or initiative that they're coming forward with. And it's been great, because all our witnesses say, this is great. Um, island-proofing is marvellous. It's absolutely essential that island-proofing is done. But you know what? Certainly from this side of the desk, it seems to me that um, there's a little bit of ambiguity about exactly how island proofing is going to be done and approached by all these 60 plus local uh, uh, public bodies. So my question really is focused on this. Um, well, just before I pose the question, I'll just say one more thing. What has come obvious is that lots of witnesses says that they tell us what they, it mustn't be. It mustn't be a tick box exercise. It mustn't be somebody in one of these headquarters in Glasgow, Edinburgh, sitting down thinking, mm, well, I've got to think about the islands now. Uh, oh, I, I've thought about them. There's tick box. That's, that's, that's done. So we know what it, we don't want. But how do you, giving witness, uh, evidence now to us now, how do you envisage the practicalities of island proofing? What actually has to happen? Who would like to go on that? David, would you like to head off on that? I think it kind of goes back to the, 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 the purpose we talked about in, 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 the, in the, the bill or the act when it comes along with a view to securing sustainable, economically active populations and islands. And I think if you have that kind of benchmark at the start of the process, it's much easier to then start island proofing towards that benchmark. So, for example, when you're talking about um, a new policy or a new service or, or talking about education or, or health, is what you're talking about going to have an, a positive or negative impact on, on that purpose. And I think really, you know, that it all runs back to that, I think, the purpose of the bill about sustainably, economically active island communities. But how would you know the impact on the people in the islands? How would you know? So, for example... Sitting, sitting in Edinburgh or Glasgow, how would you know that? For example, um, <coughs> ferry services or um, schools, for example, or health service, will that change in service improve the sustainability of that island or will it have a negative impact on the sustainability of that island's population and economically active population? We, we could go back to the, the point about a, the Western Isles, for example. We, we hear quite um, difficult stories about uh, the projections of population. I think island proofing should be about putting as many 
policies in place that make islands attractive to retaining people, but also attracting people into the area. And the policies should follow, should flow through towards that. So, for example, schools. If there's not a school in the community, it's not going to attract um, or it's not going to retain young, uh, young families if there's employment and so on and so on. Is there housing available? We talked there was in the earlier session about private uh, business and so on. Some of the businesses we're talking about are probably quite small scale in terms of hotels and and uh, fish farms and so on and so on. Are we having, are the policies around the table between public agencies and, and private businesses aligning to make sure that these um, aquaculture jobs are possible within that community? So it's about thinking about when we're talking about building houses, are they going the right place to make sure that, that happens? <laughs> I'd like to try and bring Ranald in, and then and then and then I'll let you push it again. See if Ranald has, has another opinion. No, it's, it's not really a different opinion. But um, I think uh, what I would say is, um, a, an island impact assessment is not a self-assessment. I don't think that would be credible or um, could work. I think um, in our evidence we suggested that there are models in terms of this two-stage process for the strategic environmental assessment or the qualities impact assessment. Um, that would suggest that there's a gateway or an office that you can consult um, about your, your policy or plan that says there is no island impact. Now, what that looks like, where that would be based, and how, that, how, you, know, how you ensure you have the, you know, the, the, the cut across to, to be certain that there isn't an impact, then I, th I think that, that is something that does require a bit of thought and attention. I do think that, that um, you know, there's an awful lot of areas that wouldn't be having an island impact, and you can actually probably address it quite quickly, but you do still need to have, I think, some some skill or some somebody who can actually act as that gatekeeper, and I don't know exactly what that would involve or, or look like. Mike, do you want to come back? Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at. I mean, if I can just say, we all agree that's what the, the, po the policy should be. People should be thinking about all of these things, but my question really, uh, uh, and, and you've answered this one really, is the practical implication of something. So the suggestion is there, I think, is that somebody sitting in an office of Scottish Water, let's say, in, in Glasgow, whatever it is, um, how do they know whether their initiative is going to have an impact on the island of one of the islands? So should there be, a, you know, should there be a creation of, a, of an island's office staffed by people who know, we had that in the previous panel, a point there that, should there be an island's office staffed by people who know about the islands where public, these 60 odd public bodies, that could be their first port of call, for instance? Would that be a practical way of dealing with this? I mean, I understand that you're saying it shouldn't be self assessment. I mean, a lot of the islands want, want self assessment, I I'm sure they do, but it wouldn't be necessarily practical for these 60 organisations. So it's the practicalities I'm looking at. Ranald, just before you answer that, I, I, it's probably also fair to say that we heard last week on the Western Isles. Uh, that unless you've actually lived on an island and and know the problems of an island, you don't really, uh, or have experienced problems of islands, you don't know an island. So perhaps you could bear that in mind with the person who you're thinking or the group that you're thinking. Ranald, I'm going to bring you in and then Stephen. Well, uh, as a person who's lived on an island and from an island, and maybe I'm, I'm okay on safe ground, but um, in, in all seriousness, I, you know, it, it might well be, um, we, we talk, we've talked about the preparation of the plan. And I think a lot of the evidence you've heard has talked about co-production as an important element of that. It might well be a co-production of the, the gateway facility. It might well be you identify a number of key agencies who form that, who act as at quite a high level. You know, the, the, the first submission comes in and all of those agencies, if they be at Borsnagalic or um, SNH or, you know, the, the local authorities all say, well, no, we don't see an impact for, for our areas. How they manage that, how they consult, and how they engage, be it through community planning or, or something else. Um, I, I think there's scope to, to come up with a, a concept, and I think it links back to the, the co-production of the, the, the plan itself in any case. I think you, know, you need to think about that as well as, as a plan. You need to think about what an island impact assessment looks like and how that process is going to work, as well as writing at what the plan itself will look like. Thank you. I'll bring Stephen in, and then I'm going to move to Jamie. Like, I, I suppose, um, if I'm, I'm reading your question right, how do we know it's going to have a domino effect? How do we know that some change in health or social care will have that domino effect? And, and as we flagged, you know, people have clear expectations about what the type of health and social care should be provided to their communities, and often that's based on history and legacy of, of what's been in place to date. 
and what might change. So, uh, you know, a, a simple example, we might be changing dental services on an island because of new policy that's coming in around public dental services. Will that have a material impact in the short, medium and long term on the viability of that community? If that community is no longer accessing services on their island with a very low frequency um, and in the future they might have to travel to the mainland. Is that going to have a significant impact? In health and well-being outcome terms, you might argue 10 years down the line you will see that. Some people won't be able to travel for dental services and that has a knock-on effect in, in health and care services. Will that prevent people coming to move to the island if they don't feel there's a service there which can support their health needs? That domino effect, which will then trickle down, you might argue is actually quite small because we might be talking about very small community and ways of, of mitigating that. Or actually, is it one of those key building blocks which will have a, a ripple effect that in health and care, care so terms we won't understand necessarily, but maybe with our other colleagues in some of the community planning discussions, we'll understand that will be the case. Yet, we'll have to make a tough decision on, on what's required for that area there. Is, is that what I'm picking up around that? I understand the, the point that you're making, but who, who makes that decision? Are you sitting in Oban making that decision? Or how do you find out whether the lack of a dentist in, say, Mull uh, will, will, will affect them? How do you find out? Do you, do you just look from your office in Oban? Are you just making that decision yourself? If I'm clear. Our approach has always been about engaging with our communities. We develop locality, community engagement processes, co-production processes around this. Um, so we will continue to do that. The, the bigger point to me is we'll do that as a silo in isolation. We'll engage with some of the communities directly affected, but we won't necessarily be thinking about that broader sustainability aspect at that point in time because people are concerned about how am I going to get my service going forward, not the future of sustainability and viability on the island. Communities reflect that, in, and I think that's where we have a risk of people saying island proofing is going to slow and delay things because you're going to go through a number of hoops, be they tick box or otherwise. OK, I'm going to bring Jamie in now. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think that leads on very nicely. You've given a practical example there um, of how this bill may affect you as an agency. Each We have a unique <coughs> opportunity. Each of the panel members are uh, part of an agency who will be directly affected and will have to produce these island impact assessments when the bill goes live. So I'm very keen to sort of draw out of you um, what you feel this bill places on you in terms of the onus to produce these impact assessments. As it stands, it applies to the development, delivery and redevelopment of any policy, strategy or services that your agency performs, the effect that has on an island community and what can be done to improve or mitigate that decision. And that could be any area of policy or service that you provide. So it's very all-encompassing, specifically on health. Um, how are you going to produce these island impact settings for every decision that you make to justify that decision, to look at the effect that will have, potential effect that will have on an island? And then what happens next once you've produced that assessment? Does it just, you just present it back to the minister and say, well, this is the effect this will have on an island, but nothing actually happens to mitigate the effect that change may make? So. Um, what are the practicalities around these island impact assessments and how can they actually improve life on an island? Um, health seemed to... Uh, and, and as soon as he finished, Stephen, you looked down and said, I'm assuming that was because you wanted to speak. Indeed. Um, absolutely. We recognise how, how important across all our, all our communities, mainland, rural, as well as island communities, health provision is, health and care provision is. And, and I think it's going to be a real challenge for us to manage the expectation of what do we mean by island proofing and island impact assessment and, and how that operates in practice. At the moment, when we introduce service change, we in involve and engage our communities in that. And as part of that, we have a, a range of processes in which I've listed in, in the evidence submitted that we would follow and assess against things. And the outcome of that would be with those communities, this is what we found and this is what we'd recommend as the change going forward in the form that was originally prescribed or actually has been developed and iterated through that engagement. Um, I guess I, I put my head down a little because I'm thinking I've got 23 islands, inhabited islands, and some of those 
access services, you could argue in an equitable way, from those who have resident health and care services on the island. And that's just about scale, geography, history, legacy. We, we know we have to change the way we deliver health and care services going forward and people's expectations and aspirations are very high on those communities, highly concerned about viability in those communities if there is a domino effect. Our biggest concern is we will absolutely look at health and care need, and I use the word need again, rather than aspiration or expectation, because with, if we don't focus on that, we will no way have the resources to deliver that. And with the challenges we're facing, we cannot do that. So we have a process at the moment which brings it to health and social care, that bigger question, how does that affect the future sustainability and viability, I think is where we need to sit that within either community planning partnerships or a and other agents. And, sorry, Jamie, can I just bring in Shana and then come back to you, please, Shana? And this was uh, purely to offer up our experience because as well as doing a national Gaelic language plan, we, uh, we have the function of requiring public authorities to develop Gaelic language plans for their authority, um, for their service. So it's not the same as doing a Gaelic proofing exercise. It's actually a sort of more proactive uh, approach. So saying you, know, you deliver whatever service, you're a, a, a local authority, you deliver these services, um, how are you going to support and promote Gaelic within your local, uh, local authority area? And we have a team of officers who work with officers in the public authority. Uh, we do um, monitoring of those plans. So that, that's different from, from proofing, but it is another approach to seeing, um, and it may link to the island's plan of seeing what is it that we expect to see and, and at, are those policies going to fulfil what we expect to see or not? And that's maybe a way of measuring them. Okay, John, can I bring you in and uh, then come back to Jamie? Sorry, just because there are questions lining up here. John. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, specifically on that point, you know, the, the view, who polices the plan then, basically? And is there an enforcement role? I mean, I know that sounds <laughs> a very heavy term, but if it's going to be meaningful, there has to be some outcome, and the outcome can't be that it's put in a shelf and doesn't have any relevance. So is there any policing sort of role for them? Um, we have a monitoring um, a monitoring role within within the board. Um, so the, the authorities are required to submit uh, reports and progress. And we do try to work in a collaborative way with the authorities. Um, there is th an ultimate sanction that the minister can intervene um, if, if the view is that the, the authority has failed. Um, so, so within the Act, there is that opportunity. The other thing I was going to say, sorry, that I didn't mention was for developing language plans, there is statutory guidance um, which tells uh, the authorities, you know, how, how to do this. So maybe an island proofing, it's the statutory guidance that will actually describe how it's to be done and how it's to be implemented, how it's to be monitored and, and reviewed. So that, that may be one mechanism that answers your question. Okay, Jamie, do you, do you want to come back in? Thank you. Um, uh, that's, that's a really interesting point. The, um, nowhere in this bill does it actually use the words island proofing. And it's really important that we note that. Um, we talk about it a lot, and that the intention of the bill is to island proof. But all it actually is doing in part three is saying that island, there must be an island community impact assessment Indeed, the only line that talks about regard to island communities says a relevant authority must have regard to island communities and carrying out its functions, full stop. So there's no real island proofing going on. My question is, real island proofing would require potentially huge financial backing to properly island proof decisions. So, for example, in a health environment, uh, instead of closing a, a, a GP service or a dentist surgery or what have you, Island proofing would mean that you wouldn't close it, but that would require huge financial investment on the part of the agency to island proof your your, your strategy. So, how f you know the th what are the f have you seen any financial consequences of this bill, or is it j are the financial consequences just in producing the impact assessments, not in actually delivering properly island proof services? Stephen, that looks like you're in the in the frame for this one. Um, I, think, I think you're right. Island, <coughs> island proofing suggests that you're providing a completely equitable laying, playing field of all services for health and care in all those island communities. So, so uh, Butte could look across at Isla and say, yep, we've got equitable service provision there based on that. Um, in, in reality, 
to achieve that, you'd require not only a huge amount of finance, but actually more importantly, where you're going to find the workforce and resource to deliver that. And resource in that full sense, education, training, interdependencies, partner employment, all these sorts of things. Um, and, and, and I think that makes it highly unlikely, uh, unlikely that that will ever be, be achieved. Um, the key issue for us is when we're impacting assessment, impact assessments, all the ones that we do, we're looking at what are our mitigations around some of the changes, how are we preventing that being a significant change in service. And, and again, we're under legislation that says if there is a significant change in service, you have to go out to full consultation and there will be a ministerial decision on particularly around health services. And that's something that we know we follow through, etc. But um, we are faced with really difficult choices in transforming health and social care going forward. We know we've uh, an ageing workforce, all the things that I don't want to, to repeat here, but if we can't recruit a GP to an island, what is the mitigation we need to put in as an impact assessment to ensure that that community's needs for, for GP services is met? And that might be a very different model to what's in existence now, and actually what we have put, had to put in place in certain of our islands. So the proofing element is actually more about what's the alternative service delivery that meets the need, balancing against expectation and aspirations of those island communities who will see some of those changes as threatening the potential viability of those services. Okay, I mean, does anyone else want to just pick up on this this issue of cost for island proofing? Very happy. Ronald, if you do that, and then we'll move on to the next section. If we just may. very quickly, you know, I do appreciate the point around island proofing, but I'm not entirely sure that I agree that island proofing is having the same level of services in every island community as you have in every urban settlement or uh, urban centre. I think it's giving due regard to the island's needs. And I think that's the point that perhaps I should have been clearer and said earlier on. But I think uh, in our evidence, we've suggested there are some high level areas that seem to be particularly felt by island communities, sustainable population, um, fuel poverty, um, demographic shift. Um, that, that these are the, 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 the you know, if, if we're actually able to address the, the, the key areas that are impacting on island life and island sustainability, then I think that's better than perhaps having, you know, you know too much of a focus on having, you know, a comparable level of service between um, Beaumont and Bears Den. You know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's getting, it's, it's, it's finding the right balance. And um, I think if we could really start seeing a shift with more sustainable populations, and uh, um, you know, a higher average wage in a lot of our island areas where it's a real issue. Um, fuel poverty is something I hear about in the Orkney Community Planning Partnership and the Outer Hebrides Community Planning Partnership much more so than I hear it elsewhere. I think that, 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 that for me is what island proofing is, is if we can address, the, address these issues. And I think the nature of the plan and the annual report and the refresh every five years means that we can, we can shift what, what our focus is, hopefully, as we start um, addressing some of these, these big challenges. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to the next section, which is Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, this is just a brief wrap-up on costs. We've covered costs uh, related to consultation, and I think we've just covered uh, island proofing costs. So it's basically, I think, just boils down to uh, does the financial memorandum uh, properly address the costs associated with the bill? Um, you, who would like to go on that? I mean, uh, draw it... If anyone would like to, you know, is there enough money for the plan, you know, in the bill? Who would like, would anyone like, Ian, you? Uh, I, I think, is, is, is there enough money? I think it's a very open question. I think the, the one thing I would say is that the way it's laid out, it does make a suggestion that one size fits all, and I think that's really what the island's, the, the bill is looking to challenge. Um, very, very difficult to, you know, to make an assessment on the actual costs and how they're actually going to fall. But I'm not comfortable with the assumption that one size fits all and that therefore a cost for one agency will be the same you know, right across, right across the piece. But other, other than that, I've, I realise the need to, to cost it. Uh, uh, and, and at the moment, I don't see any other way to do it. But I think there is always that danger. And I think that's what I see as the benefit of the bill uh, and looking towards an island's policy is that we change our mindset from a one-size-fits-all view of public service. Does anyone else want to make a comment or is it, does that summarise the thing? Um, it appears that, 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 
there is no one else to make a comment then. So that brings us neatly to the conclusion to th for me to thank you on behalf of the committee, Stephen, Ian, Ranald, David and Shona for the evidence that you've given, including the written evidence that you've submitted. It's been very useful and it will allow us to uh, consider the points you've raised as we draw up our report. So thank you. I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting and ask members to stay in their seats while we allow the witnesses to, to leave the room. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to move on to agenda item two, two, subordinate legislation. And this is the consideration of two negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments and there have been no representations to the committee on these instruments. Would anyone like to make any comment? Uh, Richard. Yes, convener. I'll, I'll refer you to the instrument in regard to the M, M8, M73, M74 motorway change of speed limits. Uh, these regulations arise as a result of uh, roadworks for improvements that were done in the M8, M73 and M74. And the regulations will reduce the speed limits from the national motorway speed limit of 70 to, in some cases, 30. 40 and 50. Now, I note that most of these are in regards to the M8, M73, M74, but also the A725 and A726. Most are in regards to slip road um, exit or, or coming onto the, the motorway, but there is also eastbound carriageway and westbound carriageway, circular carriageway or certain parts of these, um, so, some of these roads. My point is, and whilst I'm not against uh, this uh, SSI, my point is what action will be taken to inform uh, drivers uh, what the speed limit is as it's now been changed. It's been in there uh, uh, for a number of years in certain parts of these motorways, and I would like drivers to, be, to know it's been changed because at the end of the day, uh, police are going along these motorways and may capture... Uh, drivers who don't know that the motorway uh, in certain parts of these sections that the speed limit has changed and I would like the committee to uh, comment on on this. Uh, Richard, as, as your, your comment is specifically that you, you're not objecting to the order, would you be happy for uh, the committee to write uh, and raise this matter with the minister um, that we feel that uh, it should be properly signposted with, with speed limits so people are aware of that. Would that satisfy you? That would satisfy me and I'd be very obliged for that. Okay. So is, is the... Uh, well, before we go to a question of whether they agreed, there is the other uh, instrument, uh, which is the uh, closure of a railway station. Uh, I, I'm afraid I cannot but say that as it doesn't exist anymore, um, it's been landscaped into the ground and, and removed, that I'm assuming that, that no one has any comments about that. Uh, I therefore would like to ask the committee if we agree uh, to both... Uh, sorry, uh, John. Yeah, convener, j just for uh, perhaps the casual listener who may uh, listen to this, it has, of course, been replaced by a, a superb piece of infrastructure, and I, I think it would be appropriate to commend the work that's gone on in that area with the improvement. Absolutely do agree that the new station is, is infinitely better and, and I'm glad the new station has been <coughs> built, as I'm sure is everyone, um, but the other one does no longer exist. Uh, so, um, subject to the committee writing to the Minister uh, regarding the speed limits, uh, is, is the, happy, the committee happy it does not want to make any other recommendations in relation to the, the uh, instruments? Okay, that's... Uh, that therefore is agreed and that concludes uh, committee's business. Thank you.